We're doing some illegal guerrilla artistic activism. Were you commissioned for this? Uh, no. They will call the police on your ass. All right. Hell yeah. Dude, you keep look out, man. Dude, Make yeah, sure nobody out. roll up. It's the middle of the night in a sparsely populated back alley in Detroit, Michigan. And that sound you're hearing is Syntex, a Detroit-based Native American graffiti artist tagging the side of a building with a huge mural of a young indigenous child. And while I'm the last person you'd want watching your back in case of some kind of roll-up, fruit or otherwise, I knew Syntax was doing his small part to force us to see a cast-off nation of people. I wanted to change my own personal narrative on indigenous people, understand their deserved place in this stolen nation, and become a white man who listens for a change. Also, who doesn't like to sneak around and do graffiti at night? Today on the podcast, we have Soma Holland, daughter of freshman congresswoman Deb Holland and a Native American activist. But first, get ready to hear from an invisible nation that is done being ignored. The FBI just came out with a report that Native American hate crimes have gone up almost like 60 to 70 percent. This is Crystal Echohawk of the Pawnee Nation of Oklahoma. She co-led the first comprehensive study about America's view of indigenous people. When I read it, I was shocked because it blamed media assholes like me. According to her, the problem is invisibility. Not sure why I didn't see it coming. Invisibility to some is a superpower. Invisibility is not a superpower. It's actually one of the biggest threats we face. When they don't see us, they dehumanize us and we don't exist. And so we oftentimes don't get included in important pieces of legislation. And this lack of legislation leads to terrifying real world consequences. Native Americans are being killed by police at a rate higher than any other group in the country. Native American women have the highest rates of rape and assault. And Indian youth have the highest rate of suicide. This is eye opening. And I wanna be an ally in Crystal's mission, especially considering white liberals often need more information about how to move forward in a pro-native way. Yeesh. I'm here with a field producer and JV football star, Todd Bieber. <laughs> it's funny. For those who are listening and not watching on YouTube, Todd is wearing a, uh, a, a hip red and white varsity squad jacket. Yeah, it's the first time you got to pick on somebody wearing the varsity jacket um, because you're actually bigger than that person. <laughs> so <laughs> You think you're safe wearing uh, a, a sense of the outfit of a 17-year-old on the body of a 40-year-old, but you're not. <laughs> Let's be clear, I'm not the 40-year-old here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Todd is a field producer on the show, was a field producer on The Opposition. We worked together on the Solves Guns Project. We've mm -hmm. worked together f for quite some time. To you, what is this story? This publication came out recently that said two-thirds of uh, Americans don't think that Native Americans are oppressed in any way, which is completely false. Statistically, there is some horrible things happening within the Native American community in the United States, and nobody knows about it, and uh, they're basically invisible. Yeah, I think like something that, that came up as we were following this story was some terrible things happening within the indigenous community across America, some awful stats, but a community that wasn't being reflected in media. And I feel like as yeah. we talked about that, the articles we read and this study that we went, eventually talked to Crystal Echohawk about was sort of condemning media people in power, entertainers, uh, for not at all representing Native Americans, and when they do, having outdated images of Native Americans um, and outdated stories that are being told. So where are you pointing the finger? Is this... Not me, right? It's everywhere. And when they do show up, there are either these stereotypes about the mystical, magical Indian or drunks or over-sexualized Native women. We're really sort of relegated to these historical stereotypes. She's right. Misrepresentation is everywhere. Books, butter, butter substitutes, television, cigarettes, Victoria's Secret models, movies, mascots, costumes, cornmeal, Coachella. Misrepresentation is a magical cloak of invisibility. It would be like using a caricature of Martin Van Buren to depict all white people and their experiences. And it's still very much accepted within the United States to engage in this level of racism. The Washington football team, that is a racial slur, right? The R word is a racial slur, it's the N word. When Megyn Kelly, when all that blew up around the blackface, right? America was like quick, but what nobody noticed, if you watch that segment, those horrible Native American costumes were in the background. Cannot dress as a Native American, that's apparently been some rule. Isn't the whole purpose of Halloween to dress up and pretend you are something other than yourself? <laughs> People understand that blackface increasingly is wrong. People don't understand that that sort of 
you know, objectification and, and misrepresentation of Native peoples is wrong as well. If we could double kick out Megyn Kelly, I think a lot of people would. <laughs> right, it, seriously. Uh, and the elephant in the room, I'll call it out, you and I are both white men. Mm -hmm. One of the struggles here was there was an indictment on the media, but also the indictment of uh, white folks, also liberal white folks, for having outdated perspectives on Native Americans and that culture. And so I thought this was an interesting challenge within us. Uh, how do you tell this story? I have a show called Klepper. I joke about it, but like that is a privilege. Um, we'd like to tell this story, but it's again being told by somebody who looks like the people who continue to tell that story. And I think doing 15 or 20 different pieces with you, this is the one where I felt like, oh my God, I know nothing about what I think I know about. Like it, it, I, We came out of uh, a particular interview with, with um, Chinupa where we hung out with him. He's an artist in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And uh, I think he blew my mind like five or six times where he said some things that I was like, that is changing the way I think about, not just about the world, but about my, myself. Now, I'm a white guy talking about uh, Native Americans being invisible in culture, partially because guys like me tell that story. Mm -hmm. Help me tell that story by not telling that, what the f do I do? Your foundation to create a conversation around Native people and Native visibility is a false foundation. Like, I'm from the Great Plains and I'm enrolled in Mandan, Hidatsa, Arikara. Down here, I am like a, like a witch. You know, there's no such thing as a Native American. Uh, we are... Well, what know, am I doing this episode on? I mean, here's the question I, I'm asking you. If we're going to talk about the invisibility of Native people, we also need to start talking about the complexity of Native people. Like, I can't talk for 562 nations. I can't talk for people in my own tribe, honestly. I can't f***ing win. I think when I went to Chinupa, who, by the way, uh, behind the scenes, because someone else dropped out the day before, I was in the airport and someone had found his website and we called him and we're like, we're going to go meet this guy who ended up being a huge part of the episode uh, because he was so interesting. But like what he said was, uh, you're already, you're going down the wrong path. He told us to, uh, that we've been focusing on the past and your episodes about modern American, Native Americans. We should be focusing on the future. And that's something that like, we didn't even, like if you look at the pages of notes that we've, we, we, didn't, we didn't even think about talking about what the future of Native American um, and indigenous people looks like. And he made it very clear we were, we were doing the wrong episode. <laughs> All of the scholarship on Native people is dependent on us being dead and gone. But they haven't talked to us within the last 200 years. You're a white man in a society that has incredible amounts of power for right now. Talk to Native people and get to know them one-on-one -on -one and weaponize that privilege. To be fair, the story almost didn't happen. Melissa and I, who's an AP on the show, had to fight pretty hard to say this is a story worth telling. And uh, I remember, like, because we come in with, like, literally we pitch you hundreds of stories. So it's not uncommon that a story that is worth telling isn't told because you can only tell eight stories. So. And to be fair, I read dozens of them. Yes, it, it shows uh, when we Thank come you. in the room and pitch them. Thank we you. get really invested in, like, there's murdered and missing indigenous women. There is teen suicide. There is all these things that we become very saying, like, uh, these are the hilarious issues that we should cover in Comedy Central show. And you sometimes say, this sounds really sad. Why, where, where is the story here that we should be covering? And I think that, uh, how did this get approved? In improving stories, we only get to do eight, and it's a big yeah. investment. Uh, there are a lot of important stories out there. Big question that I have is one, why are we telling the story? Yeah. Um, and what can we do with this story? I don't think I ever doubted the importance of this story, yeah, but it's like uh, I am a comedian on Comedy Central, and so a lot of it is is again, why does this guy tell it? And I, is there a way that we can find some comedic take in there that allows it to be that allows people to engage with this in a way that a regular documentary on uh, sixty minutes wouldn't yeah. be able to do that? Um, mixed also with like a big part of this show is we want it to be experiential. I was unsure if I could find the path in my head. And I remember you and Melissa coming in and, and pitching. And I remember Melissa uh, was very emotional about it. It meant so much to her. Mm -hmm. And I know it meant so much to you as well that, like, I trusted you guys. And, like, and I think it was a different story than what we thought when we, we were there in that room. But we're a small enough office where I know you put that time and that energy into it. And at, at some point it's like, 
if, if it's there, we think it's there and we know it is this important and you can see it in everybody's eyes. Like this is the story we got to f-ing tell because yeah. nobody else is f-ing telling the story. Yeah. Then I was, I was being a dummy and I'll admit that. And we'll edit that out of this part of the podcast. Yeah. But, uh, unless yeah. it makes me look uh, sympathetic and thoughtful, in which case we'll probably keep it in. Yeah. Uh, that joke lands, so we'll probably keep it in. <laughs> How do I be an ally, not an appropriator? You need to go meet people who've been sort of on the front lines. We're not the Lone Ranger and Tonto. We don't live in teepees here. We never did. And hey, we don't wear headdresses. We use computers. We have cell phones. We exist in a 21st century. It's ripe, you know, for arts and culture and music. Fashion designer, a New York Times bestseller. There's a new film that was written by a Native American writer named Sterling Harjo. Not only are we still here, we we got some real cool shit going on. What was exciting about this story was we got to meet a lot of people uh, in the indigenous community across America. We met uh, artists, we met politicians, we met Deb Holland, we met Deb Holland's daughter, Soma Holland, who's actually going to be here a little bit later. We're going to talk with Soma. Uh, we met students, rappers. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, punk graffiti rockers, artists, graffiti the, artists. Yeah, you also met chefs. Remember, you had to eat venison. I eat venison. Yes, mm-hmm. lovely chefs who were opening up a food truck uh, in northern Wisconsin, yeah. which is tough. I don't know how you serve food out of a food truck in northern Wisconsin. I guess you invite people into your truck. Yeah, you don't stand outside more than about three seconds. At least <laughs> we didn't. One of the most exciting things about this story was getting to meet and be there with Deb Holland, who was one of the first. Uh, female Native American women elected to Congress. And we got to kind of be there on the ground, not only in New Mexico with her helping her pack to come to D.C., but then we also came back and were there on the day, I think it was January 3rd, when all the new folks got uh, sworn into Congress, which yeah. was it's a pretty powerful day to be there. Yeah, we had been to D.C. for a lot of different projects, and that was maybe the most memorable trip to D.C. that I've ever been at because it was like AOC got uh, and Deb Holland and Sharice Davids. It, it was it was a really moving day. If you want to make an actual difference, why do that in Congress? I try to look at things as an opportunity. Yeah, Congress is the most, like their approval ratings, like 29% or... I didn't want to bring it up, but <laughs> ACNE has a better approval rating than Congress. <laughs> exactly. But I think we're not talking enough about Native American issues right now. Mm -hmm. The environment, climate change, renewable energy, uh, missing and murdered indigenous women is not in anywhere near the, you know, level of discourse that it should be in our society. I'm curious, Mm -hmm. are you worried about over-representation? Over-representation? Two whole people in Congress? (laughs) Oh. No, not at all. Also, he started to weave in um, my own personal story, which was when I was a kid, I was in a thing called the Indian Guides, which was a bonding experience I had with my father, where you basically dress up, you wear a little leather skin vest with a bunch of patches on it, a little headdress, and you go out into the woods, you learn how to make fires, you do karaoke and perform um, in funny little variety shows with a bunch of other kids and their dads. Occasionally, you beat drums. Yeah. I didn't think much about it. And to be quite honest, I, had a, I enjoyed it. It was a nice bonding experience with my dad. I look back at that and it, it does, it, it sits oddly with me um, just because it felt like we weren't engaging with uh, the Native American community, yeah. but we were dressing up. And I, I don't think there was, you know, from my, I don't think there was malice in it. I think it was just like this was kind of accepted. It was the norm. It'd be too easy just to say, oh, this was some weird old racist group that people didn't know about it. I think there was an attempt to, um, to bring Native American culture into suburban Michigan. Yeah. And to be honest, it was a fun bonding thing with my dad. Mm -hmm. But I look back on what that was, and I feel... (laughs) I feel weird about it. Yeah, you should. What is it about that program? Like, why don't you guys have that? I think the reason we co-opted the idea of Indian guides is because our own traditions are slavery, institutional racism, and cultural genocide, which are... Not exactly great weekend activities for a father and son. (laughs) We walked out the door knowing kind of this Indian guide through line. And uh, we sort of assumed we would talk to a bunch of different people, have these experiences. And I think storytelling wise, we thought we would probably end this episode with me uh, atoning through an Indian guide performance. because You wanted to do (laughs) the Super Bowl shuffle with your dad. 
Um, <laughs> yeah. I said, yeah, of course, let's do the, the, the Pawnee Shuffle. And I knew in my heart that I would never allow you to do the Super Bowl Shuffle. <laughs> to give context for it, <laughs> yearly what you would do as somebody in Indian Guides is you would go to a weekend retreat, and there was a variety show, and the group I was in, which was the Pawnee Tribe, we had two very successful years where we won the variety show. One, we did the Super Bowl shuffle, which was called the Pawnee Shuffle. So those are like my biggest memories. They truly are of performance. Yes. And the 85 Bears. Yes. And so comedically, we thought maybe there was a way to do a woke parody version of the Super Bowl <laughs> shuffle. <laughs> do you hear yourself saying it out loud? <laughs> I don't know. What is comedy in 2019 anyway? I, I don't know. A woke version. <laughs> Let's say that again. A woke version of the Super Bowl shuffle from 1985 Bears as Native Americans with your dad in an episode where we are not shining enough light on uh, Native Americans. I, I think that like part of like what our journey was was saying that like you go into these episodes with an idea like how do you comedically end these things mm -hmm. and uh, as you, we started interviewing people, it became very evident that that was the wrong way to to, to end the story that yeah. should be told. I remember in the car ride back from Chinupa's uh, house, we were we were in Santa Fe. We were driving back to the airport, and we were talking about like how we were going to end this episode. And I think yeah. at that point, we were still far away from doing the Indian Guides <laughs> remake of the Super Bowl Shuffle. Mm -hmm. But I think we were unsure what it was going to be. Yeah. And I think it was you in the car. We were kind of like, I think, what if we were we keep struggling how to tell the story and how we end this story. It's not our story. Mm -hmm. Let's give it over to somebody who's already trying to articulate something that we just simply can't. Yeah. And so <laughs> we gave a good 90 seconds over to, to Chinupa to make a story. Yeah. And again, one of the things he often talked about out there was like the stories that aren't being told are the stories of survival and they're modern images of Native Americans. They're also like uh, futuristic images of Native American culture, which I think resonated with us where it was like, Fuck talking about old school uh, Native American images of people in teepees fighting against the Indians. Like we already know that's racist and out mm -hmm. of touch. Uh, it's setting up images of uh, what Native Americans look like today, but more so in the future that people can live into. And that's what art can do. And I think Chinupa said that much more eloquently than I do and in a much more fun way. So like, I, th I think what we felt good about at the end was giving over some of that power. Yeah. And I think that it's true. I think if there's any success in an episode like this, I do think like I get to be somebody who is hopefully similar to a lot of what our audience members are, like learning and changing their opinion as they move through. So I might be inarticulately moving through, which again is uh, is not a bug of the system. It's a it's 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 a, a virtue mm -hmm. that my ignorance is not only bliss but it's articulate, Peabody worthy. I think some people have said. Yeah, having submitted some of your work to the Peabody, they would disagree. <laughs> Um, but, uh, yeah. Okay, yeah, that might be true. I, uh, I, I, th I thought there were mailing issues. Uh, uh, yeah. No? <laughs> By the way, we both have one Peabody's, though. <laughs> we have, yes. You, you for The Daily Show and, and me you, for The Onion. You for The Onion. Mm -hmm. That's right. You were an intern at The Onion? Yeah, I was. And they, like, I was literally the lowest rung <laughs> at The Onion, but they, I, I was on the, the list of people, and so I got a Peabody. Yeah, I think your your onion Peabody can be seen in the the work that you've done now. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I think we made it about us again. Yeah, I think you're right. This is this is the danger. This, this is, is the danger. Yeah, yeah. Chinupa made it very clear we we're telling the wrong story. The thing that resonates with me is not only telling the story of Native Americans looking forward. But also the absurd idea that even the term Native American isn't of itself ludicrous, as if it is one unified group. There were 500 plus tribes uh, across the country for us to be like, in 22 minutes, we'll dispel some of these myths. Like, that is ludicrous. Yeah. Not that it's, I think it's a story worth attempting to tell, but hopefully. Somehow if, we did it. I don't know how, but we did we it. We totally nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, but I, I hope I hope you can start to dispel some of those uh, those images at least uh, start to dismantle it. We are joined by Soma Holland. Soma, how are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Now, I just before this, I had asked you how you wanted me to introduce you. Yeah. We met because you're Deb Holland's daughter. Mm -hmm. I don't want to call you Deb Holland's daughter. Everybody you're, else does. So I'm, not, okay. I'm not going to do that, Soma. <laughs> I know um, I send you into an existential quandary yeah, of how would you absolutely. like to be 
named or titled? Yeah. Did you come up to a decision? Do you know um, who you are yet? I, I still don't. <laughs> I I think I take after my mother in the way that I'm I'm kind of a jack of all trades, you know? <laughs> I am a theater artist at home in Albuquerque, uh, but I do a wee bit of activism <laughs> and writing here and there. I think the last couple years of my life were really spent uh, helping my mom or supporting my mom to get to where she is now. So We've seen you a handful of times over the last mm -hmm. five months. When we first got to see you, it was at your house in uh, New Mexico. I will admit something. When we were coming up to your house in New Mexico, we were walking in, the cameras were following us in, and open up the latch, but the latch was locked. And so I had to reach around to unlock the latch of the side house, and uh, I slipped and fell on a cactus. And literally... I literally up, took a cactus up the ass outside of your house <laughs> and then walked in and I, f I was in pain that entire day for like a classic Looney Tunes uh, comedic mistake. <laughs> and this is how compelling the story is. Yeah. That's not even in the, the cut. This is in Comedy Central and I took a Looney Tunes fall on a cactus outside of your wow. house. It's not even in the cut. Yeah. So if, if I looked at all uncomfortable that day, it's because oh, I, okay. I was. That explains a lot, yeah. actually. <laughs> it's happened to all of us. You're a New Mexican now, actually. Am I? Because I, I that's happened to me. They're still more comically I sharp. I, I remember walking around and asking people, like, "Do you know how sharp these cactus are? They're really <laughs> sharp. They're really sharp." <laughs> it was really cool to see the relationship you and your mom had. I know you were getting prepped to see your mom move to DC. What was that whole process like? It was pretty weird, honestly. I think that a, like the culmination of everything that happened didn't really hit me until. Uh, that the day of the swearing in, it just didn't really hit me because, you know, my mom stayed the same. Like she didn't develop an ego. Our relationship didn't change. If anything, I think it got tighter. And so um, it just didn't really hit me until she was actually there. Well, yeah, what was that day like, inauguration day? It was insane. <laughs> <laughs> it was really cool though. I kind of, spent a lot of the day like documenting things on my own Instagram and in a way I think that was my way of kind of like processing it for myself because what a millennial um, I know I really am oh my but, god um, <laughs> but it was just it was wild you know I I think it kind of hit me all at once uh I got to go watch in the gallery while she was being sworn in and like it was cool seeing AOC uh Ayanna Presley like all of those people and Nancy Pelosi and just being there for that like truly historic moment was, it was mind blowing. It was really cool. I will say <laughs> we got to spend a little bit of the morning with you guys. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, her that, office was really full. <laughs> it, was, it was packed, but there was, yeah. there was such joy. And I think we mentioned this, but there were so many people who had come from all over to celebrate what that day was. And I'd never been in that building before, which is where it's the offices of uh, many of the members of the house. Mm -hmm. There might be a couple buildings, but that that was packed. Mm -hmm. What was also nice about being there with with you and your mother is also like this is this is like the the, the good part of democracy, where people totally. are coming because they're feeling represented, because it's celebratory. Uh, the energy was great. I don't know if you got to see it, Soma, because you were in with your mom while we were there. But we got to walk around, like Jordan's saying, and what we definitely noticed was that like. Your mom's office, uh, Sharice David's office, uh, those were filled with uh, people that they were representing. <laughs> and there was a line of people that like totally. were like, we're here to celebrate because uh, we're indigenous people, we're Native Americans, and th they're representing us for the first time in Congress. The other groups were typically white men in suits outside of white men in suits offices. Yeah trying to get them to, like, <laughs> buy military contracts. Well, and even, and like, up in the gallery, I was, like, because I could see, I was, like, in this corner seat, and it was just crazy. Like, the Democratic side, it was, like, so colorful. There's, like, kids running around, women, like, people wearing all kinds of different things. And then the other side was just, like, men, suits, red ties. This kid sitting next to me, he was like, oh, that's my dad. And he, like, points, and he's like, he's the guy with the red tie. And I was like, looking, and he's like, he's next to the guy with the white hair. And I was like, yeah, I totally see him. I remember later that night, uh, we were we were at a bar, we were eating dinner, um, 
p- perhaps doing both. Uh, <laughs> but the news was out of the background. It was, it was all the, the big highlights from the day. And that image, I think, was shot from the gallery looking down of your mother and Sharice David hugging in those tears. Mm-hmm. That, it was such an emotional moment. I mean, even just yeah. people in the restaurant watching and pointing and putting food down, like... It felt like something was uh, something something was happening. Yeah, and I feel like that you know is kind of a representation of um, how a lot of Native people feel. Like you guys said earlier, the term Native American is interesting because there's so many different nations throughout the United States. But I think that being said, there is also this sort of like brotherhood, sisterhood, camaraderie felt in between all Indigenous communities, and I feel like that moment was a really cool representation of that because, you know, my mom and Charisse are friends, of course, but I feel like they didn't even have to really know each other that well in order to have that moment of being like, we made it, like we're here together. And like knowing that you have that thing in common with somebody where you've come from a long line of like struggles throughout the generations and to be there together was just really cool to see. Now, what happened? I heard there was a trip to Williamsburg a couple days after. Yeah. Colonial Williamsburg. Colonial Williamsburg. Not, oh, not I thought it was just a, a trip not. for vinyl. No, it was, oh, <laughs> oh yeah. Colonial Williamsburg. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. we took a train down to Virginia, um, and I got to go to Colonial Williamsburg in the Jamestown Settlement Museum, which was pretty interesting to see because um, just the representation of Native people in museums kind of on this side of the country is very different than what I've experienced back home. What does that representation look like at Jamestown? What I noticed uh, just going into the museum was there was literally this sign that said something like um, about how uh, people were brought over from Africa and Africans and Native people and Europeans all like worked together to create America. <laughs> and I was like, that's that's not really exactly what happened, but okay. <laughs> but they have to sell t-shirts at the end, you know? Yeah, uh, exactly. Reality is hard to sell t-shirts off yeah. of. Yeah. I think, um, did you post a video of a white guy in uh, war paint? Yes. Well, and here's the thing. So I, I ended up writing an article about this for Teen Vogue, which I was really lucky to have the opportunity to. Um, and someone, this woman whose husband actually works at that museum reached out to me and we had a conversation and she said that the guy who was dressed like that, um, cause he was wearing like buckskin and red face paint and all this stuff, uh, that he was actually part native from the South, from Louisiana or something. Um, I knew he wasn't part of the nation that he wasn't part of the Powhatan people that are originally from Jamestown. But I explained to her that, you know, because of the context that the entire museum kind of set up as you walk through the museum and then go into this Indian village that they have outside, um, it just, that was not apparent to me at all. And I just found it kind of bizarre um, that they set up this like interactive exhibit where kids can like play and do all these things, but like completely disregarding what actually happened. Or, you know, like they wanted to share some of, you know, the Powhatan traditions, I suppose. But as a native person, I personally like don't want to share parts of my culture with people unless they understand the attempted genocide and all these other things that took place. Do you mm-hmm. know what I mean? I feel like so. there's a there's a buy-in. You can't. You can't just. You can't swing yeah, by for the day. Yeah, you deck. can't just. And that goes into like any form of appropriation, right? You can't just take the parts of a culture that you want to use and you want to celebrate. You have to understand the entire history of it, or at least try to. I'm fascinated by the idea that, like, oh, in the the Southwest, the Southwest museums and what have you already know how to handle this in a much better way than the yeah. East does. Well, and I think that part of it too, like, if you go to the the Indian Pueblo Cultural Center in Albuquerque. Um, it kind of takes it takes you through a timeline, but it also shows you like what indigenous people are doing now, like a where are they now type of thing. Whereas I felt like at the Jamestown Museum, they set up this whole history of these people that used to be here, but they don't talk about how any of these people still exist, mm-hmm. you know? Um, and I feel like that goes for a lot of indigenous representation in media. Um, 
yeah, just a lot of people talk about Native Americans like they only lived in the past. I think that was something that your article really touched on. And then Chinupa, who we talked about, also touched on. It was one of those things that was really enlightening to me talking to both of you about this was that uh, when we go to a museum, typically like uh, Native American indigenous culture, the they're behind glass cases. They're dead and gone along with all these other artifacts from other uh, groups that are dead and gone in our society, like Rome and like um, Egyptian culture. And it's like, but Native American culture, the things that we're seeing behind glass cases are still used and still in practice today. Yeah. So it's not like a dead and gone culture, but it's treated repeatedly like it's dead and gone. And that has a huge impact on uh, contemporary like legislation, uh, racial bias, be- because um, we're we're treating them a, a group of people that are a huge group of people in the United States like they don't exist, and it's uh, we're taught that since like I know I was taught that since like first grade. It was absolutely. Yeah. I had a I have a friend because I I went to the Met the other day. There is a lot of stuff from New Mexico from like the pueblos around where I live, and. It was really cool for me to see. And the Met actually does a really good job of, you know, acknowledging the land (laughs) where we are and um, the people where these things came from. But I think, yeah, the museum has all these old things that are art, but I think a lot of people don't realize that um, they're used, they have a purpose. And also we still use all of those things today, right? They're like, oh, this is this like old dress or these old moccasins it's like no we still use all that stuff and I think that was another thing like when my mom was sworn in we all came dressed in our traditional attire and to me that's normal because I wear those things at home all the time um like for ceremony I've worn traditional clothing to like both of my graduations but um like just walking through the Capitol building, people literally just like looked at us and like stepped aside. And it was just apparent that a lot of people hadn't seen anything like that before. Yeah. You know, it's a, um, it's a, lot, a lot of red ties. Like, yeah. And pe- <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Can I ask a question? Yeah. This is a dumb white guy question. There we go. This That's kind of your sweet spot, right? It is. Yes. <laughs> that's me. Uh, so uh, this is something I found as we were going through the transcripts yeah. uh, that I didn't realize until later. We had interviewed probably like 20 or 30 people for this. And I noticed that certain um, people that we interviewed would say indigenous. Certain people would say Native American. Certain people would say Indian. And oftentimes there was no crossover. They would only use exclusively. It wouldn't be interchangeable. Mm-hmm. Basically, like for me, dumb white guy doing the interviews, I hear indigenous, I hear Native American, I hear Indian. It all registers as one thing. I get back and I see that, um, like, uh, this one guy in Wisconsin only said Indian. And, That's really interesting. Yeah. And uh, and then, uh, again, like I said, other people only used indigenous. And it, Chinupa, I think, pointed out to us, he's like, this idea of you keep saying Native American is the wrong term. And do you have any insight uh, to a to why that may be? I've been asked similar questions to this before. What I've noticed is some, because I think I use them interchangeably. Now Mm -hmm. that you say that, I think I've used them pretty interchangeably, but I think, um, I know that specifically Indian is like only, only Indians can call themselves Indians, I think. okay. Like not officially, but if like white people calling someone an Indian is kind of like, uncomfortable I think in even my me experience. asking this question is, is but, like I've been told is wrong no <laughs> I'm not, I'm it's like, fine this, yeah. is a, this is a safe space this is um, a safe podcast okay uh, great like I'll say you know and I think that when I'm speaking to other native people I will like call myself Indian but um, I I think at least this could be totally wrong. This is in my experience and kind of what I've seen over like this social media kind of indigenous renaissance that I've been witnessing um, is that indigenous seems to have come more recently. And I feel like that's kind of an umbrella term. Like when I think indigenous, I think that that includes like Aboriginal people in Mm. Australia. I think that that includes, um, you know, indigenous peoples of, Oh, everywhere Brazil. I was just everywhere in, Brazil, in, South, Amer- yeah, in yeah. South America, exactly. Yeah. Like I think to me, indigenous sounds like an umbrella term for people 
indigenous people everywhere, not just um, kind of in the United States, whereas Native American, I think, is like all Native people within America, okay. you know? I think for you, Todd, what I would say is like, take that, and when you think about talking, Maybe the easiest thing for you to do is just not talk. Nothing that's safe. <laughs> yeah, I feel that's like that's the safest thing. Just yeah. yeah, and and honestly, in whether it's around situations that you feel could be dicey or just social situations, yeah, I've found that like your best game plan is to think about whether you should speak and then choose not to. I think yeah. you just have him on the podcast so you're not here talking about yourself the whole time. Right? A little bit. Yeah. 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 He's, sort of, yeah he's like yeah, a, a punching bag, if yeah. you will. Yeah. Well, thank you for coming on and joining us. Yeah. Thank you for having me. When your mom gets the unredacted Mueller report, will you share it with me? Absolutely. That's all I ask. <laughs> <laughs> if you like listening to this podcast, you're going to like watching it even more. So go check out Klepper. It's on all of your devices, including your television. Go check it out. Thank you for listening.